So let's come on back and um, get started. I'm going to take this opportunity as, as you're all coming back over to our session here to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Mika Estrada. Um, I was first introduced to Dr. Estrada's work, I think it was two and a half years ago, not long after we got our grant. And we were kind of honing in on what we meant by humanizing, looking at the research. And I remember being at um, a STEM event at UC Berkeley and hearing Dr. Estrada speak, and I had no context for her work. And I just sat there and was like, this is it. This is, this is the connection. There, this has to be part of what we're doing. And I heard her use the phrase, kindness cues of social inclusion which is from an article um, that, that she authored, co-authored. And that became a very formative component of the academy that we were building at that time. So we began to think about each of the eight humanizing elements as kindness cues of social inclusion. And so we've used that in the academy, as I said, and um, I just really can't tell you how much um, Dr. Estrada's work has meant to me, and it's been a pleasure to get to know her as a human also over the past two and a half years. And I'm so grateful that she's agreed to be our keynote speaker today. So I'm going to turn it over to her and, um, and um, Mika, invite you to share a little bit more about yourself as, as much as you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I realize I always bring way too much. So I'll probably I talk really fast. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to plow through things. But I'll just say that it's really an honor to be here. And when I first became aware of the work that was being done um, in the humanizing online education work that Michelle is doing, I was stunned. <laughs> I was stunned because as an academic, you write, um, you do research, you write, you put it out there. And really i felt like um this program kind of took what i had been writing and what and the research i'd been doing and took it to the next level so um, i'm delighted to be here and what i'm going to be doing is kind of telling you about the research that framed um the recommendations and the things that i that i wrote about and i hopefully will have a little bit of time for questions at the end but i am going to start because there's just lots to do i'll just say i'm a trained social psychologist i study how people integrate into community and in this case how students and faculty and scholars integrate into stem builds okay here we go so i come to my research with the same um bit of evidence that was stated earlier which is that some groups do not uh, go on in academia and in STEM fields at the same rate as other groups, and particularly Latinos and African-Americans, Native Americans, um, become less and less represented at the higher the degree is. And it's you can see it's like we're about 36, 37 percent of the population, um, the U.S. population, but only about 10 percent of the faculty. And if you look at administrators, it gets even smaller and smaller. So this is the issue that I was most interested in addressing, like, why does this happen? So I want to step back for a minute and just say that for a while in the olden days, not so long ago, there was this idea that things were very independent. You could take a tree and you could plant it anywhere, whether it was in a forest or by itself. It was a tree, it was a tree, it was a tree, and it was going to have the same experience regardless of where you put it. But we're now learning that there's all kinds of reasons why a tree in a forest is very different than a tree standing by itself. Um, there's mycorrhizin and mycelium and roots and all different kinds of connections that are happening underneath and through the air that help the trees to communicate with each other. There's interconnection. If you want to learn more about this, I really recommend this book, Lessons from Plants by um, Baronda Montgomery, which also talks about mentorship. It's really a great book. Also, when I was learning physiology, we learned about the different human systems, right? The endocrine system and the digestive system and all of these different systems as if they were separate and they never impacted one another. And again, what we're learning now is that these things do impact each other. What you eat and how you digest might impact your, your hormones and your hormones might impact the way you're digesting. I mean, all these things are interconnected and we're learning that interconnection happens. So there's a paradox. Things, including humans, can be separate and simultaneously, they're highly interconnected. That's the assumption. And that's the paradigm shift that we're really talking about, that we're shifting away from this old notion of kind of this independent thing, person, to this interconnected web. Okay, we talked about the pipeline and how people go through it. I think of it more of a braided river. This was um, 
this was published by Rebecca Batchelor. And you can see one of the, cute, the really neat things about this is the idea is that people come in and out. And this is true of our modern day learners. They come into academia, they might work for a while, and then they re-enter. Um, so people, students and scholars are becoming older <laughs> and they're entering and exiting. And that's, that flow is really upheld by mentorship and holistic support. An inclusive STEM workforce is what results if we do this the right way. So every person has a story. And so I'll tell you a little bit about my own story. What am I connected to? Just like all of you, you have connections to, right? So all four of my grandparents are from Mexico. They came to the United States during the revolutions. At the bottom, you see um, the two people at the bottom are my grandparents, my mother's parents, who got married during World War II. My, my grandfather served in World War II. And then above is a picture of me with my parents, my dad going to Vietnam, and, and my parents being very young, um, 20 and 21 when I was born. I have ancestors and, and people who came to Southern California and were picking oranges. And by the time I was in high school, um, things were not so easy. We were on AFDC, that's what the food stamps are, that's what we used to use to buy our food. And the book down at the bottom, Cry of Hope, was written by my dad, really just talking about his experiences with drug and alcohol um, issues, which impacted my life quite a lot. So all of these things played in, right? They played into developing my history and my families and what my socioeconomic background is and work ethics and values that come from hard work, people who work in the fields and emotional experiences that happen and traumatic experiences that happen. We all have them, students have them too. So for me, I ended up after I finished my PhD, um, which happened up in that picture there with my mom and dad and my son, I was pregnant with another child at the point when I was graduating from my PhD and I just was done. <laughs> so I was home with kids for about 10 years thinking I'd never go back into academia. And then eventually I did, I went back and um, now my kids are all grown and I'm, I'm doing it, I'm back doing you know, research and all kinds of stuff, which I never thought I was going to. So I think my value system had a lot of impact on why I stopped because my kids mattered to me, my family mattered to me. That was like a priority in the Mexican household that the moms are home with kids. <laughs> um, but also that academic experiences were really important to me too and learning and giving back. So I wove in and out and maybe many of you have and many, maybe many of your students have moved back and forth. Okay, so to understand the moving back and forth and all of that, you have to have a longitudinal study. I was uh, fortunate to be a co-PI on the science study, which was an 11-year study that tracked historically underrepresented science students who had a strong interest in pursuing biomedical research careers. They were drawn from over um, from 50 universities. 25 of the campuses had these RISE programs, which is the Research Initiative for Student Enhancement. It's funded by NIH. And um, 25 of the campuses did, didn't have that. So we matched students. Half of the students came with um, from that RISE program that were involved in the program. This is really an assessment to see if the program worked or not. <laughs> and then we matched them with students who were demographically very similar uh, using propensity scores. So they had similar ethnicity and gender and majors and GPA. We matched them as close as we could so that at time zero, they look very, very similar. And then we looked to see, does this program have impact or not? 72% of them were female, about 50% African-American, about 40% Latino. Um, many in biological natural sciences. This was very representative of the RISE program at that time. So we found a lot of things, but this is um, one of the findings that I wanna share with you. Now that top line, so this is looking at what's their intention to pursue a biomedical career. So if you look at up above the zero, you'll see that everybody's intentions were pretty similar at time zero. This is what we wanted, right? The matched group and the RISE groups to look pretty much the same. But then you see across time how they start to, to wane, right? So the top solid line are the RISE students who had research experiences. The, bottom, the next line that's kind of dotted is the matched group that had research experiences. The solid line underneath that is the RISE group with no research experiences, and then the very bottom is the matched group with um, no research experience. So there's a couple things I want you to notice about this. Uh, one is that when you have students who have high intentions and interest in science, what you're trying to do is not necessarily grow their interest when they get to higher education. What you're trying to do is help them not lose it. <laughs> they come in ready and enthused. Um, at the community colleges, I don't have data on the community colleges, it may be a little different there, but this is what we're seeing at the four year college level. The second thing, so there is there is impact from the rise program, you can see that the rise lines are a little bit higher than the dotted lines on both kinds, whether they had research experience or not, but that research experience was really important and I wanted to understand why that was important. Why did research experience have such a large impact. Enters my advisor Herb Kelman who unfortunately passed away about four weeks ago. 
Um, but his theory was that about how people integrate into community. So this is a theory called the tripartite integration model of social influence. And it's basically it doesn't have to only be about science, it can be about any, any type of group that's important to you. So the first element is, can you do what the group does? So as a, as a teacher, you know, can you teach? <laughs> um, can you do this thing? Can scientists do the science? So when we're becoming a part of a group, we have to be able to do what the group does. If we can't do what the group does, it's hard to be a part of the group. The second element is, do you start to identify as part of the group? In this case, am I a scientist? Do I belong here? Is this, is this a part of who I am? Am I a professor? Am I a teacher? When you think of groups that matter, you start to develop that as kind of a part of your identity. And then the last piece is, do you start to internalize the scientific values or the values of that group? So um, in the case of the scientific community, do you agree with the values that the doing, doing, using this methodology helps to advance knowledge, that it can help to make the world a better place? It's a good use of your time. Those are the value elements. And the, and the theory is that these would be positively related to integration, which is when you persist in the behaviors of that group. In our case, for scientists, is they continue to want to be scientists or they engage in science, right? There's, or they try and be, stay in STEM in some way or another. And what we found when we measured these things is indeed, they are positively related with, with this um, outcome of persistence. When we use a structural equation model, this looks at what uniquely is predicting uh, integration. So in this case, efficacy, identity, and values were measured when they were undergraduates. And then we looked at their sense of whether or not they wanted to continue to be in science a year and a half, two years later. So what you see from this is that surprisingly, the self-efficacy is not the key component for people making decisions to persist. It's really that scientific identity that's really important and the, the development and the endorsement of the values um, of the community. So this is, this in some ways is old news. This came out in 2011 when I published this, but at the time it was kind of um, new news that the self-efficacy was not the only thing that was important. There was a lot, a lot of emphasis on, if we just get people to build the skills and they have confidence in their skills, they'll continue on. But for these students, um, again, who were mostly Latino and African-American, Native American, it was really the identity and the development of them sense, sense of themselves as a part of this profession that was really important. Okay, one of the great things about longitudinal studies is you can start to look at really long-term outcomes. So this is um, data looking at four years after graduation, what happened? Okay, so in this case, our outcome measure is not do they intend to stay in STEM, but have they stayed in STEM? Whether it is in a professional job or in academia, have they stayed in STEM? Did they go into a medical career or did they go into another career? And then we also look in this at what contributed to their efficacy, identity, and values, and how did then that predict outcome? So the mentorship and the research experiences, efficacy and values all happened when they were undergraduates and then we're looking four years later what happened. What we find is that research experience at least two semesters was highly predictive of the development of the efficacy, identity and values and that the scientific identity again was the thing that predicted whether people stayed in STEM or not. And then quality mentorship was really important. And I wanna emphasize here that the quality mentorship is not just having a mentor. Having a mentor did not predict any of these things, but having a high quality mentor was really um, important and instrumental in all of these things. So what's quality mentorship? We measured it as um, provide psychosocial support, instrumental support and networking. And these are the kinds of questions that were asked. Um, does your mentor discuss questions or concerns regarding feelings of competence, um, commitment to advancement? Do they convey empathy? Do they encourage you to talk openly about anxieties and, and fears? Um, do mentors share personal experiences with you? That's the psychosocial, right? That's kind of like the emotional um, belonging component. Instrumental support is um, mentors help you do the thing that you're trying to do. Do they help you with your writing or to develop the new skills or to finish assignments, you know, the concrete piece? Networking has to do with, um, does somebody help you connect to other people in the, in the university or outside of the university who might be relevant to their career advancement? Okay, so, so we learned that effective mentorship was important, quality mentorship was important, and research experiences. The next, um, this is an, another study that we did looking at how effective programs, what they can tell us about what contributes to scholars integrating. So um, this research was the Gifted Forward study, and it was done with uh, Lilibeth Flores and John Matsui at the University of California, Berkeley Biology Scholars Program. This is a program that's been running for about 28 years. It's um, been, been um, very effective in helping uh, what I guess we would call high statistically at risk students do really, really well. And they've, we've collected data over time looking at how um, those students who are in BSP, which is the dark 
the dark blue line there. Um, when they're in BSP, they, they tend to get degrees and have uh, GPAs that are closer to the usual UC Berkeley freshmen. The light blue line at the bottom are students who were matched who demographically look a lot like the BSP students, but were not in the program. So you can see kind of what the um, benefit is of being in the program. So we knew this coming into the study, but we wanted to know what about the program might be impacting these things. And I think that um, what we learned is has relevance for, for classrooms and even online classrooms. So this is again a structural equation model where you're looking to see what uniquely predicts. So two things that we measured were about the program were how enthusiastic were students about the activities of the program. So some of the things that they had were advising, they had webinars and, and in-person um, seminars went before it went online. Um, they had uh, cohorts that they worked with, they had classes. So they had kind of the, the typical um, wraparound types of, of support systems for, for a student who's um, starting at Berkeley that usually in the program for two or three years. The second thing that we looked at was social connection. And this had to do with, did the students spend time with other people in biology scholars program outside of their classes or outside of BSP um, events? Would they miss other students? Would they miss the faculty? Would they miss the, the, the staff? So there was a bunch of questions about kind of their social connection to everybody in BSP. And what we found, this is just published actually just a couple months ago in um, Cell Biology Education. What we found was that both of these things were important and they were both uniquely important. So this is this is really um, critical because in the course of the humanizing um, online education course, you know, there's things that you can do, but how you do them also matters. And I think that that's one of the beautiful things about this curriculum is they actually talk about <laughs> how you do it, not just what you do. Um, so a lot of programs have the same components, but some of them are effective and some of them not. And when we think from this data that the social connection component was really important. And when and you can see from here that both activity enthusiasm and social connection led to efficacy, identity, and values. And again, what we saw before, the identity and um, the values were what predicted STEM integration later, their persistence, their intentions to persist. So mentoring in ways that build social connection may be important, particularly for historically excluded and first generation scholars, which I think is mirrored in, in, in the things that we heard earlier today. So I wanted to just share with you two more really quick studies and then I'm gonna kind of caveat off in another direction, but um, we wanna compare in groups. So this is with graduate student data for majority and historically excluded students. It was, had to do with a program called Bridge Project. And one of the things that we wanted to look at was um, what was contributing to the development of scientific identity and kind of pull apart that instrumental support, psychosocial support, professional networking, friends and family support. So we looked at this model for those who were um, historically excluded and those who were over, who are the majority group. What we found that was for the majority group, um, the only part of that model that came out significant was that professional networking support when it led to greater um, science identity led to greater persistence. But when we looked at uh, the results for historically underrepresented students, we found that the instrumental support, the psychosocial support, and friends and family support were all really important uh, and were mediated by the science identity, which then led to greater persistence. So I think this is also consistent with the, with the work that's being done here in building those things. Does culture make a difference? Um, in a study, uh, Lighting the Pathway study with Kathy Dearwater and Lilibeth um, Flores, we looked at, um, we've been tracking Native American scholars, mostly graduate students across time, and again, looking at similar elements, but this, in this case, focusing on Native American culture. So we looked at cultural values, how much the mentor shares cultural values and how much the mentor understands cultural values. And by Native cultural values, um, we asked them what, what, they, what they meant by that. And these are some of the words that come up, like family, community, environment, traditions, knowledge, those kinds of things. And we've tested this model looking at six months, predicting 12 months, predicting 18 months. What we found was this is a little different than the other groups. And again, remember these are graduate students. What we found was that the quality mentorship was not having the effect that we've seen with other groups, but that mentor cultural knowledge was really important for um, the building of identity and values. And that this value element was what was most predictive of student persistence. So a couple of things about this. Um, for many native scholars, they come from tradition and from a history in which their culture was, was um, 
you know, they tried to wipe it out, <laughs> you know, through genocide and through all different kinds of acculturation methods. So for a lot of Native scholars, the idea of forsaking or leaving their culture behind to become a scientist, to assimilate into uh, a majority cultural view is just is not something that is desirable. So I'm talking to my colleagues who, who are on this paper. Actually, this paper is under review. It's really close. I think it's going to get published really soon. Um, the understanding is that having a mentor who can model keeping cultural values, native cultural values, in, in addition to having scientific community values, that those that those combined um, mentors who can do both of those things are really instrumental. The other thing is that what we see is in some of our data is that this idea that values scientific identity might predict somebody staying in um, a STEM field from undergraduate to graduate, but when people are start to get to the point of trying to pick their career, the value piece starts to become more important. Is this really meaningful work? Is this something I really want to spend my life doing? And so we, we see this shift. So I'm not sure if this if the scientific value piece is a cultural element or if it's just a time in, in history in their, in their um, career development that makes that difference. We're now doing scaling this up and um, we have a new R01 grant to, to continue to follow and to look at modifications in, in the program. So um, so up to this point, let me check the time. This is always my time checkpoint. Okay, we're doing okay. So um, I think what we know to this point is that people, connection is important, right? <laughs> and not everyone connects in the same way. And how connected do we feel to our professional communities? I think this is a great example of people trying to connect on things that are interesting. It's really important. And in which way we grow and grow others, you know, how do we do that? So I'm going to turn a little bit now to, to some of this work on kindness. I recently ran a study um, on kindness, and this is how we began the study. So I'm going to give you one minute to do this on a piece of paper or a, a, on your computer if you want to. And I want you to recall a time when someone was kind to you in a professional, in your professional life. And it really will help you if you, when you write this to put some details of what happened, how, how you felt, you know, what were the details of that event. So I'm gonna start the timer. And I'm gonna say, go ahead and go. All right, we've hit one minute. <laughs> um, so I would like you to put in the chat a word or two that describes how your body feels after thinking about a time when someone was kind to you. Relaxed, warm, safer, solid, happy, cozy, grateful, lighter, full, supported, grounded, expansive, appreciated, <laughs> warm fuzzies, empowered, included. All right, thank you, those are great. So I've done this exercise quite a few times and there's a few things that when I'm, when there's time to like break out in sessions and like talk about some of the stories, there's a couple features that come up pretty um, regularly. One is that um, often we recall a situation where somebody did something for us that they didn't have to do. That seems to be what we remember. And often the person uh, had control over resources or some kind of power that we didn't have power over ourselves. So they might be somebody who had access to something or who could do something that you that you were not able to do. I think this is really important thing for especially um, teachers and instructors and faculty to think about because we're often in a situation where we have um, a little bit more power than than the students in our in our in our courses. And what we do is likely to be more remembered. 
whether it's in the positive or the negative. So we have a lot of opportunity. I think we have more opportunity even to be um, to use kindness as a, as a tool and a power for, for good in the world. So why should this matter? Um, emotions and cognitions are inseparable. How people feel, these words of belonging, empowerment, like all those things, those things impact um, how we feel. There's been a lot of emphasis on studying threat and how that might lead to, to flight and freeze and fight and appease. But whatever our emotional status, it, it impacts our sense of belonging, um, which impacts our cognitive processes and our motivation when we feel like we don't belong and we're uncertain about that, it can take up cognitive space, which takes away from learning. Um, there's been really great research by Eisenberger and, and, and others looking at the brain impact. So when you look at where the brain high, gets light, lights up when you have pain distress, it's a similar area for social distress. So the neurocognitive substrates are very similar for those two things. So it's really real, social, social distress and, and alienation can be really um, cause us pain. And emotion states influence decision-making, problem-solving, our processing, our attention, our assimilation, all of which are, are critical, right, for learning. So I've been asking this question, I've been getting feedback, and I really wanted to do a little bit more of a systematic study. So this last um, spring, early in the spring, I launched this new kind of study, and this is only, I think, the third place where I have presented any of this outcomes. So we're still working on data analysis for this. Uh, we found that most of the people who responded to the to the survey were in academic settings, and most of them were professors or in um, working in a higher institution in some way or another. And I want to talk a little bit about kindness because I've been reading books and things that have been on kindness, and a lot of times they cite the research on altruism or helping and equate it with kindness. So altruism being something, a behavior that benefits others, but doesn't necessarily benefit the person who's doing it. And, and everybody knows what helping behavior is. But I really came at this and the measurement of kindness in a way that's different from this. So I define kindness, as Michelle said, as acts that affirm the dignity of another person, that affirm somebody. It could be a macro affirmation or it could be a macro affirmation, meaning it could be really obvious or it could be a subtle way of communicating this. And I measured it looking at um, really drawing off of the work of Donna Hicks on dignity. And these are the different kind of elements of um, what it would feel like to receive kindness. You would get one or more of these things. Um, you felt free to express your authentic self without being negatively judged. Your efforts or your thoughtfulness or your talents were positively recognized. Your feelings, concerns, and experiences were acknowledged as valid. Others conveyed you were included in some way. Others' actions made you feel safe with them. You were treated fairly. Your choices were respected. Others made an effort to understand you. You were given the benefit of the doubt. That's a key one, given the benefit of the doubt. People really um, don't like it when they're not given the benefit of the doubt. And you receive an apology when dignity felt violated. So you can actually mirror this onto a lot of the activities that are in the humanizing online education, because many of them do, oops, do this thing. I have that automatic hand going up thing. I don't know how to put it down. <laughs> anyway. Um, I got you. I got you. Thank you. I don't know how I put it down. Should never have put that on. Okay. So that's the receiving kindness. And then we had questions about acts of kindness, which are exactly the same things I just said, but they're in the, I did this as opposed to it happened to me. Okay. So when you take this kind of definition and you're saying altruism is kindness when it affirms the dignity of another person in one of those ways that I just described, or helping is kindness when you affirm the dignity of someone else is one of the ways that so you can think of times when you try to help somebody and it makes them feel bad about themselves and they feel like you're humiliating them, like you can't, like they can't believe, <laughs> you don't believe in them in some way. That's not a kindness when people feel that. So we have to do, do the teaching and do the work, but in a way that affirms the dignity of people, not lose that dignity element. So again, the receiving, I already went through all of these, but this is the measure that we're going to see in the next slide. So we did a correlation. This is all the data was taken at one time period. So we're looking at correlations. And what we found was that we asked people about how much they identify with their institutions, in this case, mostly academic institutions. And what we found was that people who identify with the institution tend to experience less stress. Um, they tend to have greater well-being and they report receiving kindness at a higher rate than those who don't. Those who receive kindness also report that they have higher well-being and they're more likely to engage in um, kindness actions. So I want to just put up the little caution signs. Correlation is not causation. This is descriptive. We don't know which is impacting what. We don't know if those who receive kindness are more likely to identify with institutions or those who 
identify what institutions are more likely to receive. We don't know the directionality. All we know is that these seem to be happening in concert with one another. And they're probably happening in classrooms as well. <laughs> okay, this is something that uh, a paper that I published in 2018. And we do have some element here of time. So we found that the micro affirmations, which was kindness conveyed as a subtle or ambiguous, ambiguous cue, when it led to greater scientific identity, did lead to intentions to persist. This was undergraduate. So this gives some inclination that maybe there's directionality in this, that when people receive and experience um, kindness, that then that leads to the identity and the intentions to persist. Okay, the last thing I want to share with you from this study is that we asked people after they had um, written about a time when someone had been kind to them to write a word that reflected the first comes to their mind and then a second word and a third word. So I asked you to do one word, but this is two and three. And I want you to notice on the first word, you know, grateful, happy, grateful is just like overwhelming, right? And there's not a lot of diversity in words. <laughs> there's a lot of focus on just these few words. When you get to word number two, there's more diversity. You still see grateful, but you start to see appreciative and supported, inspired starts to emerge. And when you look at the third word, you get motivated, um, inspired, respected. I mean, I think that what happens is when you when people reflect on on kindness, a time of kindness, it first makes you feel grateful, but then it also is inspiring to do more of that yourself. Okay, so these are some of the ways that um, that some of the things that we're learning about kindness. And the last thing I want to focus on, and in some ways, I feel like I don't need this last section for this group because. Um, you're talking about all of this, but people often ask at this point, what can I do? And so I'm going to give you some ideas. What can we do? Um, the first thing I would recommend is recognize scholars are a whole person, which is all about what we're doing here today. And historically, academia has really been focused on the idea that we do what we can to enrich the mind, um, to increase knowledge and, and, and um, comprehension, right? There's been this sole focus on it. And I would like to um, recommend that we think about it as a whole person. That's why we're here, right? That the person has a heart, mind, body, and soul. For the heart, we need kindness and belonging. For the mind, we do need academic excellence. And we need curriculum and mentorship and training programs that are best practices for all people, not just for um, the majority group. For the body, you need representation. You need food and clothing and all those things too, but it really helps also to have people who look like you. There's a lot of research showing that we look for people like ourselves. When we walk into a room, we look to see, is there anybody like us? And when there is nobody like us, it's a little bit more of a frightening place. We feel a little more vulnerable. And then for the spirit, we need creativity and meaning making for everyone. And I think that a lot of these um, elements here that are in the in the toolbox, these are all ways to, to do this. And I, I hope that you learn more about them because I think they're powerful tools. And often when people ask me, I, I send them over to this website. I send them over, say, look at this thing because this is where you'll really see the, the nuts and bolts of how to, how to do this in a, in a class. Um, the second thing is remember the paradox, right? That we are alone, but we're also interconnected. One of the the studies that I'm working on is, is doing this mapping exercise for mentors. So the old fashioned idea is that you have one key mentor and they do everything for you. The new idea is that you have a network of mentors who help and do various things for you, including getting the job done, um, career advancement support, and then personal well-being. And that if you have gaps in your mentorship network, think about how to enrich this. This is equally true for faculty as it is for students. So I encourage you to, um, to think about your network and, and how do you broaden it if needed. And then grow the good. Back to the um, garden analogy. One of the things that happens, I like to garden and, and if you garden, where do the, if you looked at this picture, where would the weeds grow? You can put it in the chat. Where do the weeds grow in this picture? In the spaces. Open dirt, open, right, right, exactly. So what happens is that a lot of times we are advised to plant densely so that you don't have as many spaces for the weeds to grow and that you have lots of healthy um, plants growing. So when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, a lot of times there's a huge amount of emphasis placed on how do we get rid of the weeds? How do we get rid of bias? How do we get rid of stereotype threat? How do we get rid of you know, all of these things that are really costly? And indeed, we need to get rid of them. But one of the things we're not talking about enough, I think, is how to grow the good stuff. And I think by strengthening and building and growing that good stuff, we leave less space for the negativity and the, and the debilitating things to exist. And that's what I think is so exciting about this is that is that you're really here today to talk about how do you grow the good, which is fantastic. 
So um, in the paper that was mentioned earlier, we talked about um, how there's been a lot of emphasis on threat, um, little emphasis on kindness. We've talked a lot today about the kindness. And this is something I just want to throw out there as a tool. If you're trying to see how your institution is doing or how your classroom is doing, you can just simply ask this. You can say, um, so a prejudiced environment has high macro and microaggression and low micro and macro affirmation. Inclusive is the opposite. Ambiguous, you're getting mixed signals, right? You have low macroaggression, but there's high mac microaggressions. Then you have that high macro affirmations, which is like the posters and everything that says diversity is great and we like everybody and we want everybody to be here, but there's low micro affirmations. You can simply ask your class, are you mostly here? Are you between these two? You know, is this class here? Is it between these two? Is it here? You can ask them about the university, about the department. It's, a, it's an easy way to do hands up. You can even if you use um, annotation on Zoom, you can have them mark where they think your, the institution is or the class is. It's a nice way to get a reading and then to see what you can do to, to move that. So, and then I mentioned all these, these are the acts of kindness that I mentioned earlier. And I think things that we can do creatively, I think we have a lot of opportunity to build into our courses ways to do these things um, and to convey them in a way that shows that we're respectful of the dignity of our students and of our colleagues. Okay, so in summary, kindness and connection matters in mentorship and education. It relates to identification with the discipline and institution, communicates belonging, it relaxes the nervous system, it increases a sense of safety, um, it reduces suffering, which I think is important <laughs> in this day and age. And um, this is really good for learning. It's good for, for how we, for increasing integration of all people and it's great for well being and connection. So I'm gonna leave you with two quotes. Um, one is by Adriana Marie Brown, which um, Adriana Marie Brown, which is we need to start practicing new things into our system until they become the cultural norm. I think that's what this is all about. And then Amanda Gorman gave a, a had a poem that she uh, presented or introduced in, at the beginning of this of this year, which I thought was beautiful. But this was just an excerpt from it. it. Says, "Come look up with kindness yet, for even solace can be sourced from sorrow. We remember not just for the sake of yesterday, but." to take on tomorrow. And that is it. I've, I've powered through and um, I'm gonna stop sharing my slides and I think I just have a few minutes for talk for questions. Thank you so much, Nika. I see lots of applause coming <laughs> up in our, our Zoom reactions and a lot of gratitude in the chat. Um, so, as I look at your work again and see some of the new stuff, it just it continues to resonate with me. Um, I don't see any actual specific questions. It's just lots of powerful reflections. But I want to ask you a question. That chart that you put up that showed the the low, high, and then or I can't remember, but the middle right. was the ambiguous. Oh yeah, prejudiced, inclusive, and ambiguous. Yeah. Okay. I, I saw you present somewhere speaking about how most people on college campuses, I think you're talking about students tend to identify with the ambiguous. Space. Yeah, there's, that's where I, when I do it in classes, like when I used to do this in person, I would have people raise their hands. And a lot of, um, a lot of people feel that, that the comments, there's a lot of mixed signals. And I would, I always, I didn't have time so much to say, but Ambiguous space is really stressful for us. I mean, you can think about it when COVID started and even now when we're not sure, it's very cognitively taxing to be in, in an ambiguous space where you're not sure if you're safe or not. And so, um, you know, we definitely felt that in these recent years, but for some students in a classroom, um, whether it's online or in person, they find it to be an ambiguous space. And so there's a certain amount of cognitive space going to, is this a safe place to be or not? Do, you know, can I let my guard down? Can I say the truth? Do they actually, you know, understand the real world type of thing? <laughs> so that ambiguous space is really um, hard. And it's interesting because even a highly prejudiced space sometimes can be more relaxing because at least then, you know, like, you know, they're not safe and you don't have to like try and figure it out. So, yes. Yeah, so I think we're really trying to move from that ambiguous space over um, into that more inclusive space. And, and it's done through all these different methods that you're, you're talking about here. That point has really been impactful for me. It's something that I have thought about so many times and it also fits right into the effort to think about what we're doing in the greater context of student experiences, right? What else is happening? What other experiences are student bring, students bringing into our class? Um, 
are on yeah. our campus, right? So and, thank and you I'll, for that. I'll just say that one of the things that I think you in the curriculum has that's really powerful is that so there's a time of impression formation, which is really at the very beginning, it's really important, it's really impactful. Because once somebody forms an impression, they can change it, but they're looking for, you're cognitively looking for things to affirm your initial impression. So that initial impression formation, whether it's your liquid syllabi with, with your, you know, your intro video, like all that stuff has, has more weight than if you were to do that at the very end of the class. Those, that first impression, and I know you talk about that in the curriculum, and it's it, it really is um, a significant thing to remember that 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 ambiguity you can you can get rid of it very fast at the beginning if you if you have a nice way of, of entering having students enter into the classroom, the perfect, online classroom. Perfect way to punctuate this session. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing. It's, it's been thrilling to see your, your new findings. Um, look forward to look, seeing more of them in the future. And um, everybody, please, let's just give um, Dr. Estrada one more warm um, round of applause. And we are going to transition to our break until 1030. So I'm going to stop talking so you all can go to what you need to do. At 1030, we're going to get started with our panel. So we hope that you'll have space in your day to come back. And thank you again for being here, Mika. Sure, it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.